<laughs> what I couldn't get over is how John McAfee is every bit as insane in real life as you would think he would be. He he is he is a trip to talk to. Like who's the other like who else in the industry that's just like is like way a high? Kevin Mitnick, I thought was incredibly nice. I know there's a lot of people that have reasons for not liking Mitnick. The dude sat there and like signed crap at DerbyCon for like an hour and a half, and he never seemed to like tire or get mad at all. So, he was yeah, nice to me. It's not. It's not so much the people that trip me out. It's the way people react to the people that trip me out. <laughs> like yeah. what I see. It. So definitely, like anytime I've seen John McAfee, I saw him at DefCon. I mean, the, the line of people following him, same thing with Midnick. And what's the what's the guy that's the crypto guy with Bruce Schneier? Yeah, that they they be following that dude around like crazy. Okay, like, Bruce Schneier is actually a pretty something? cool dude in a non infosec context. Like he is. Yeah, yeah. So like, I was at a sci fi random sci fi con a couple years ago. And I walked into, there was like room parties, like, and I was, you know, just mm-hmm. let's go down in my Star Trek costume and walking around looking at the room parties. And I walk into one of the hotel rooms and it, Schneier is in there playing like the banjo. Yeah. He's big into music and Americana. Like yeah. if you talk music with him, he is one of the nicest people in the world and he'll talk for hours. Yeah. 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 It was like uh, in uh, out of context, like he was super chill guy, like handing people beers, like playing some tunes, like this seemed really nice. That's dope. Yeah. I just can't stand, like I said, the whole how people treat them like stars. I mean, it just it just blows my mind. Like, I'm I have to live up to those expectations. But, <laughs> and that's one of the things I think that a lot of people don't understand is, like, whenever I was teaching for Sands, like, you always had that cult of personality. And it was exhausting because you would have people literally follow you to the bathroom and be, like, eating a donut. And talking to you about security while you're going to the bathroom. And yeah. that wasn't just like one time that that happened. That like happened a lot. And it gets you like really jaded after about, you know, 15 years of doing that. I think and it's awesome. I appreciate you not saying my name. I appreciate <laughs> it. It's okay, Jason. That's how I we got the one job. that gets me is people just like assume that you're, you're friends or like that yeah. you, owe, you're, you owe them something. Like. I don't know. It just it just kind of gets me. It's like, mm-hmm. hey, you need to come to breakfast with us right now. Like, like, no, no, I need to go. I have a call. I, I can't. <laughs> what? Yeah. Well, I it, I had one weird thing that happened at Black Hat last year during the training. I like to sleep like during lunch, like whenever I'm teaching. Like if I go up to the hotel room, that's great. I will sleep on the floor. That's fine. I don't care. But whenever I'm teaching, I need rest. So by the elevator banks, you know where the Schweig was at Black Hat off to the left? There were some elevators. And I was sleeping like by the windows there. And I wake up and I go on Twitter and there was a bunch of people on Twitter like, holy crap, I found John Strand sleeping on the floor at Black Hat. Must have been drinking heavy last night. I'm like, oh, and some of them got pretty close to me, which is kind of weird. But whatever. Ugh. I want to stay as anonymous as possible. <laughs> yeah. Once again, I appreciate you not using my name. Velda, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. would you like to talk a little bit about Wild West Hack and Fest? Of course, I'd love to talk about Wild West Hack and Fest. It's my favorite topic. <laughs> are you kidding me? It's coming up. We are under three weeks away, right? What? Uh, mm-hmm. And hard to believe it's coming up so quickly. Um, Got tons of of stuff happening at the event. As you can see, we have three great keynotes on this call today. And we're really excited to have them join us at at the event itself. Looking forward to each of their talks. We've got workshops lined up. We've got... A really, really cool swag bag, which I'm really excited about. It'll include a swag bag lab um, oh, wait. with her. Um, on. Put it together for us. And so it's a part that you'll be getting in your in your swag bag. But just all kinds of fun things. We've got the pandana, the T-shirt. 
I just wanted to, to make a note that um, if we get your registration before it, September 11th, you should receive your swag bag, barring new issues with, with the post office. So you should get your swag bag prior. After that date, there, there could be a delay. So just an FYI, there it is. John has, has the very cool pandana. Nice. He loves modeling it. By the oh, way, has anybody oh, saw the so video that he uh, he did regarding Wild West Hacking Fest? Um, it's on our YouTube channel. If you haven't had a chance to check it out, it's hysterical. Yeah. So, so very the, funny. The joke is for these, um, we ordered these, and then like the CDC came out and said these don't work <laughs> at all. So that was a bit depressing. And then I found out you could totally wear it like this and look like a dude, bro. Yeah. Oh, dude. Dude, I do want to suggest folding it over. Oh uh, no! So <laughs> you could like put it over an N95, like to like prolong Maybe. the life of your N95 or something. I don't know. <laughs> you, you, you double them up. You pour two of those; they're good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there you go. Four or five of them, you're fine. <laughs> these are probably one of my favorite things. So. Jason had these made, and there's mm. there are these magnets, uh, and on one side it says breached, and on the other side it says not breached. So you can put it on your server racks if it's not breached. If it's compromised, you just turn it like that. <laughs> <laughs> no breached. So we got those, show. and then the back doors and breaches cards and dice and all kinds of fun stuff. Yeah, yeah that's wonderful. It's gonna uh, be a great. It's gonna be a great swag bag. So uh, excited about some of the tournaments we have going on to the Onos. Of course, Bryson Bort is joining us and the Unicorn Company. And then, of course, we have our Backdoor and Breaches tournament. So we got a lot of, of, of stuff um, packed into to the event. And it's, it's going to be good. It's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. Can I make one more comment? Please I do. Make sure that everybody's aware we're starting a new series called The Roundup. The Roundup is, it'll, it'll be anywhere from four to six hours. It's a one-day event. Our first one kicks off in October. And really, really excited about this particular event. George, and I'm going to butcher his name, even though he told me how to pronounce it. And if anybody knows how to pronounce it, please jump in here. It's George. George. George at side. Or Chiles. <laughs> or Chiles. Or Chiles. <laughs> there you go. Uh, adversary emulation is the topic, and we are looking for speakers. If you have, if you'd like to come and speak on this topic, please feel free to submit your CFP to us. You can go to our website at wildwesthackingfest.com and take a look at what we're, what we're offering. We've got tons of stuff on there, the Hacking Cast, the Roundup, Wild West Hacking Fest itself. So pretty excited, pretty, pretty exciting time to be with Wild West Hacking Fest. I still, I, I still really can't wait until we can get, I don't know about you all, but I, I, I want to go to a con. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hang out with friends. I, mm -hmm. I want to smell the horrible body odor of the people that don't know how to use deodorant. And Preach. Mm -hmm. Just having a bunch of manic conversations and trying to force it over Slack or Discord or whatever. It's nice, but it's this. not the same. Or this, yeah. It's not yeah. the same. No, we all miss people, even if you're not a people person. We'll make it through this. So it's it's a finite thing. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well said. We do have requests specifically for I'm just here for the pre-show banter t-shirt. Um, that sounds <laughs> well. I'm writing that down right now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you very much for joining this particular webcast. This is a bit different. There's no PowerPoint slides. So you might see me break out in hives and scales fall from my eyes. It's perfectly fine. But we wanted to kind of get an opportunity for people to meet the keynotes that we have coming up at Wild West Hacking Fest this year. We have Paul Vixie, we have Marcus Carey, we have Leslie Carhart. These are people that I've, I've worked with or just gotten to know recently or have known for a couple of years. It's, 
it's really, really cool because it kind of fits into that whole scheme of like getting to know people in the industry. For example, Paul. Paul is has been around, has been doing all kinds of things with DNS for years. And he's one of the few people in the industry. It's like right up there with Chris Brenton and Lance Spitzer. Whenever he's in a room, I get uncomfortable because he is one of those people that was a huge impact on the earlier part of my security life. Leslie, of course, is my black badge sister for DerbyCon. I can't remember what year we got black badges at DerbyCon together, but it's, it's, it's just... What year was that? I don't know. It's 2020, like 15 centuries ago. Yeah, it's like 15 centuries ago. It was back in the before four times. You remember those. And whenever I think of Leslie, I always think of like the, the like just somebody that's always out helping people, pancakes, and just constantly being out in the community. But also more recently, kind of a lot of really cool stuff in the realm of incident response and actually being on the ground working against hackers and dealing with actual incidents, which is just amazing. And Marcus is weird. Not saying personally weird, but my relationship with Marcus is like this. So Marcus and I have been running in the same circles, but never connecting up until fairly recently. Just from from Marcus's perspective, the Tribe of Hackers series, if you have not checked out those books, please do so. Tremendous number of just amazingly inspirational stories. Marcus has been working on all kinds of cool technologies for years. I remember, what was the name of it? The, the, you had a Honey Docs. Uh, you had some really cool websites that were taking Honey Docs and that cyber deception and that callback stuff years ago. And I'm like, I want to party with that guy. I mean, never got an opportunity to do it. You know and what's crazy about that? What's that? <laughs> you and Paul Asadorian did a book. And in that book, it was a long time ago. And in that book, you described this technique, right? The, the Honey yeah. Docs technique. So you actually inspired Honey Docs. Funny enough. Oh, that's cool. It, that, it, it, I, yeah, it, but <laughs> we created this word web bugs thing. And then all of a sudden, like you have this amazing website and you were giving it away for free, man. And uh, believe it or not, a lot of people don't know this, but proudly sucking at capitalism is the motto of Black Hills Information Security. And we actually, uh, that was actually a conversation that I had with somebody where you were doing all kinds of cool free stuff online. And someone said, that dude sucks at capitalism proudly. And so our our motto kind of comes from that. Uh, But actually, (laughs) for me, I think the most important thing from Marcus's perspective is just uh, how uplifting he has been for the community for over the past few months with COVID and everything. He's just been an absolute inspiration and a beacon of positivity. And I really appreciate that. So it was really cool to get all of you here, people that I've known for a while, people that I'm just getting to know as well, and getting everyone an opportunity to meet the speakers. So I'm going to start this out. We had talked earlier this week or last week about some topics that we wanted to discuss. And I wanted to start out with a topic that I, I think is important for a lot of people in security in the fact that so much of security is completely focused on what you're looking at right now. And we're focused on the problems that we're dealing with right now. And I would like to ask each of you, and I'll start with Paul because he's in the Brady Bunch window scheme for me in that proper corner. What is it that people should be focusing on that's not a not right now problem, but a problem that's actually coming down the line that we're going to have to deal with in the next five to seven years? So Paul, do you want to start out? Sure. So there's almost always a fire at your feet, and it's almost always distracting you from stuff that you probably ought to be doing, acorns for winter and stuff like that. In this case, um, you know, it's a target-rich environment. I I could go on at length uh, with different answers to your question. I'll tell you the one I'm worried about the most is the overreaction to all of the surveillance the sort of notifications, if you will, that came out of Edward Snowden's work in 2013. There is a general sense now that everybody upstream of you, if you're the user, that means your app, your OS, your, you know, whatever. If that's your app, that means your OS. If that means you're an OS, it means your firewall. Whatever it is that is upstream of you can't be trusted. And so we're now seeing a whole generation of technology coming down the pike that is meant to disintermediate all of those untrustworthy agents. So if you look at QUIC, the QUIC protocol that's coming through IETF, 
That's an example of, I don't trust my kernel. I don't want to make a system call in order to contact some other, uh, other computer somewhere, some server, some service, because the kernel might be malicious. Well, okay, one form of maliciousness is an antivirus program. Okay, so we kind of need to know when you're about to do that so that we can make an informed decision about whether you, the uninformed app, should be doing this or not. But that attitude is going out of style and it is going to hit, it's going to land with all four feet. I, I started out thinking that it was just DNS because that's what I do and DNS over HTTPS, but no, it's everything. There, there won't be a system call anymore. Sooner or later, these apps are going to say, I don't even want to do a system call to open a file because you might, in, you know, my kernel might intercept that. Well, great, your browser can have its own file system and we'll just have nobody trust anybody. But this creates, you know, as you can all imagine, a gigantic niche for malicious activity and malicious actors who will no longer be distinguishable. So uh, if, if I had one thing that I had to limit myself to about what to worry about, that is not the fire at our feet today, it's that. So it's almost like we, we're starting to stack security in places that's going to reduce our visibility, and it's actually going to start working against us in, in, a lot of, in a lot of respects as well. So Marcus, in our earlier meeting that we had, had something kind of similar, kind of forward-looking, and I think it kind of ties to blind spots. So Marcus, what are some of the forward-looking things that you think we really should be focusing more on, but maybe we're not giving it as much attention as we should? So that, that thing uh, would be WebSockets and how people are communicating now. So basically, I think that most of the defense mechanisms we have right now are tailored towards traditional stuff like DNS. We still don't know anything about DNS. Most organizations suck at DNS, <laughs> funny enough. But then you have DNS. They, they suck at DNS, so they don't know where the traffic's going to. But they've been relying on kind of like trying to trying to track and trace all the web connections, and you know, based on HTTP or HTTPS. But now you introduce web sockets into the into the to the mix here, and a lot of people are going to are totally stuff is going to be flying past them like crazy now because web sockets is going to. Is taking it to a new level, and also website is just like any other thing on the internet. is it was built, it wasn't built to be secure, <laughs> and so the implementations of websockets, people are going to be 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 uh, transiting stuff over, you know, over over websockets, and don't th there's no security in websockets. So you have to kind of have to jerry rig your, <laughs> and and and, and kind of make your own security there. And also, like the browser itself is kind of like the new operating system. So all the, many of these calls are coming out of, directly out the browser. There's local storage where people are storing sensitive files, and you can just snatch that stuff up and get it. It's just so much crazy stuff going on on the web right now with these single page app and React and all this stuff. It's so much data that can be exfiltrated and nobody have a clue, and it's mm -hmm. all in the browser. It's crazy. Yeah, everything is going to be Chromium. If, if Firefox ends up folding, then we are all going to be using Chromium. So one, one central engine for web browsing as well as a target, which is going to be super messy. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and, yeah. I, and I feel like a lot of the stuff we can't get under the hood, right, to really find out what's actually going on. So. so Leslie, I wanted to throw it over to you because really out of all of us that are here, I think you've probably spent more time in the trenches doing hand-to-hand -hand combat with a lot of attackers, uh, currently working with Dragos. And I love like Dragos' mission statement that Rob sometimes brings up. It's nothing less than saving civilization, right? So it isn't just that you're protecting networks and working with trying to do incident response and threat hunting. You're literally doing threat hunting on the crap that keeps us alive. So from what you're seeing right now um, and kind of looking forward in the future, like specifically what what are some things that you wish people were talking about? Wow, yeah. I mean, yes, I'm in the industrial space, and this is stuff that has a, a very real-life impact on us. And what I wish people understood is not everything is a cyber attack when industrial systems fail. So when the power goes out, the first thing you should not be screaming is, is this is a cyber attack by a nation state, because um, it usually is just a piece of equipment that's failed. But 
in reality, we see adversaries all over all over the place building footholds in really critical environments. They are getting access to the IT environments attached to those organizations, and they are building persistence. They're learning about the environments. They are staging for future attacks. And when they do them, it's going to be very, very, very bad. It's going to be probably a component of something else, like geopolitical things going on, you know, political things going on, whatever these types of adversaries want to influence or cause loss of public confidence around. But when when they launch these attacks, they are staging to do, it will be very unpleasant and it will be very hyper-focused and very specific. And so that's that's what keeps me up at night. And especially uh, verticals that we don't think about a lot are, are being targeted. Things like water and sewage. Those are very unpleasant things when they stop working. When water no longer comes out of the faucet or the water is contaminated or sewage systems back up and don't work anymore, or they start polluting water bodies. Those are nasty things that are a lot harder for us to wrap our heads around than the power going out. We all know how to handle a power outage. We go get a candle or a lantern or a flashlight or something, but sewage backing up, that's less ideal. That's a bad day. So um, yeah, there's um, a lot of areas for concern there. And we have to be willing to invest in time and money and people in in protecting those systems because the adversaries are out there. They're just not launching haphazard attacks. Yeah. Well, and and I, and I, I, you know, when we're talking about like these types of attacks, right, let's talk about a little bit on Ukraine. And I think it kind of ties in with some of the topics that we're looking at. Whenever we're looking at technologies like DNS over HTTP, whenever we're talking about WebSockets, whenever we're talking about microservices, whenever you're talking about an adversary that sets up their entire command and control infrastructure, and they can run that entire command and control infrastructure over something like Gmail, or they can run it over Salesforce, or they can run it over existing protocols that organizations normally would ignore, we're starting to lose this visibility. So I'll, I'm going to throw it back to Paul, and we're going to start with like DNS over HTTPS, because we already had a lot of people on Discord asking about that. What the hell do we do as a security organization? People are turning this on because a lot of the browser vendors are saying, hey, this is more secure. You know, it's not clear text DNS. Just think about how wonderful the world is. But a huge amount of what we do in security, for better or for worse, has to do with visibility into DNS and what we're doing. So how exactly should enterprises approach that from trying to secure their endpoints and get the visibility that they need to help protect their networks? Well, sadly, there are three answers, and I don't have time to do justice to all, so I'll I'll just slash all of them. What I'm told by the next generation when I complain about this loss of visibility is that firewalls are an 1890s technology and that I should not be using one, but what I need to do really is to secure the endpoint so that I can trust it. And the trouble is those people haven't lived long enough or traveled far enough to understand how reactionary and ignorant that statement is, but the zero trust model doesn't scale. I don't get a choice about what software is running on the devices on my network. I often don't get a choice about the devices on my network. So I need some oversight capability. And we've been getting that just as you say, by looking at the signal from DNS or maybe the signal from TCP SYN packets or whatever it is, we've been able to say, This is anomalous behavior. This shouldn't be here. Uh, I know what normal behavior looks like. This is probably not that. Let me investigate. That's all about to go away. And, um, you know, the the solution is unfortunately going to be unpalatable. But ultimately, when we do these things, it's all about engineering economics. What's the cost benefit of doing it and not doing it? What does game theory tell us? And my intuition, and unfortunately, this is pretty strongly felt by now, is that we're going to have forced proxies. We're going to have it be that uh, the devices on the network all have to trust an edge device whose key they will know, and they will tell that device, okay, this is where I'd like to go. That device can make a policy check or possibly even look at the content and say, hey, that looks like malware. I recognize that octet string, whatever. And we're going to be going through that rather than trying to just get there and letting our firewall sometimes disintermediate the flow if they think it might be bad. But now that it's blind, it can't do that. So we're going to be 
in the world where everything, all data in and out of the company gets strip, strip searched and reduced to clear text at the border because we have some uh, idealistic software and some unrealistic expectations about how we're going to secure all this stuff. Now, as to DNS over HTTP, it is meant to be impossible to detect. Uh, the, this is a, line, is a sentence in the RFC that says, this uh, protocol is designed to prevent on-path interference in DNS operations. That, of course, is exactly what a security uh, entity needs to do, is to interfere with DNS operations. And then they, we are on-path actors. So, you know, if, if TLS 1.3 and encrypted SNI blind us to the content of the HTTPS flows, and if QUIC comes along and says, now it's all UDP, there isn't even TCP state for you to figure out what or, you know or when things are anyone, starting, right? Yeah. I mean, with quick, you know, you have multi honing as well, and you have that as well. Uh, somebody just published a uh, uh, a draft specification for um, unreliable datagram service over quick. So we've we've sort of reached the uh, the jumping the shark point. But anyway. What we will have to do about DNS over HTTP is again quite unpalatable. It's quite draconian, but we are being driven to it. Our our alternatives are being managed for us. And what's left to do is to simply block all packets to any IP address that is known to uh, support the DNS over HTTP protocol. And um, you know, I have been in touch with the folks at Google and Cloud9 or Quad9 and uh, I guess Cloudflare for 1.1, and I've let them know, you really ought to publish the addresses that you plan to offer DOH from, because a lot of us will have to block all traffic to those. And you really should not share those IP addresses with other things like, say, the Google Maps API or something like that, because if you do, then all of that is going to get forced through a proxy or it'll just go away. We're not sure. In other words, the bad choices we have to make are going to become bad choices that other people have to make. And that's what happens when you use unilateralism in a fundamentally multilateral system. Yes, yeah, so, um, so Marcus, kind of, kind of jumping down a little bit more, you were talking about WebSockets. And what's interesting is, I, I think that we were talking about it once again last week, how the browser is the new endpoint, right? You, you kind of said that. I might be paraphrasing a little bit. So whenever you're doing a research by looking at this browser and, you know, we talk about loss of visibility and everybody's trying to get, okay, we're going to move to zero trust. We're going to focus on the endpoint. And yet most of the security products are completely blind to what's going on on the browser. We have shared some stuff back. I don't know if Joff's gotten you access yet to our uh, Cursed Chrome backdoor. That's a Chrome plugin. But once again, endpoint security products just don't see that. And if people want an idea of what something like a Chrome pl plugin could do that's actually evil, look no further than uh, Grammarly. You know, I talked about it last week. Grammarly is a keylog. It's literally logging everything that you type, and it's correcting your grammar. But imagine that not being used for the purposes of good and using the right there there, but instead just grabbing everything that you're typing into your browser. So when you're digging into the browser and you're doing your research, what are some of the things that have kind of surprised you and kind of jumped out at you like, holy crap, there's really no way for us to see what's going on here in this blind spot? Well, a couple of things, like I, I want to comment a little bit on what Paul was saying that you're talking about. Is yep. on the Snowden bit. Snowden is very controversial from, from the parts where I come from. But I think that privacy and security, I don't think that they're a, a match made in heaven. So I think that the more privacy, I think some things we were doing for more privacy and it's hurting security and that sucks. And besides that, uh, what the things that I see is with WebSockets and, and, and so many things in the browser, like local storage, what's funny about local storage is if developers are actively now saving sensitive data in local storage. And so you can easily enumerate local storage if you're an attacker just by putting you know javascript on on any website so you know third-party vendors and you know how people traditionally have you're loading javascript that you don't even know exists so i'm pretty sure that somebody's out there already harvesting local storage on everything when i say people are storing 
pretty much local storage in Chrome. You can it's a it's a data object that you can just store data and you can just store it in there. And developers are doing it like crazy to make some of these uh, one page apps and and React and all that stuff work well to store state. So they're storing that state. And then I guess that some some of the developers like to store the state locally in in the browser context, and then they'll store that in the cloud somewhere. So so the problem is, since the browser is the new OS, we, now we're making the same mistakes we made with the traditional OSs, and also from a network defense perspective. Anyway, like I said, WebSockets have no security whatsoever, and it's all of you're you're rolling your own security. You're rolling how you do channels. You're rolling how uh, there's pub sub models. There's third parties like um, Pusher that people are utilizing. People use a socket IO. So basically, it's like a new frontier, and people are just throwing this stuff up because it works. It works amazing. What I've been doing is I've been experimenting with web sockets as a command and control. So I've been building. I've been building bots. And I've been controlling them with WebSockets. And this is beautiful because, I mean, WebSockets run on IoT devices and all that stuff, too. So now you can control, you know, an infinite amount. You can have a million compromised machines listening to a WebSocket channel and easily control them. And what's dope about WebSockets is it bypasses a lot of security in, in most cases. So it's a People are going to be getting on left and right, <laughs> pilfered, and not know not know anything to hit them. So, Leslie, uh, you know, we've had a bunch of people talk about it on on Discord. So, w- with some of the technologies and things that you've seen adversaries use, are you starting to also think that maybe, you know, as we're moving into a stronger privacy stance, that it is directly anathema to an actual security stance for organizations, or is there a way that they can actually make this make this work more harmoniously? So people need to, I have a lot of info sick people just don't get this. The privacy and security are not the same thing. They are not the same thing at all. Privacy can be useful for security, but they are independent things. And oftentimes they conflict, unfortunately. Like as a forensic analyst, I want to be able to see everything that happened on a computer. I want to be able to see comprehensive logs. I want to see file system changes. I want to see what occurred in the web browser, you know, in terms of memory space and all the things that are happening there. But if I'm a user, well, I don't want like a third party getting that. I don't want other like applications collecting telemetry and that's those types of things. So privacy and security are different. And um, that will always be something that we have to remember as we're doing security. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't provide somewhat of a private experience for our users and also do security. We just have to balance the two things. And I mean, sometimes that can be come from like anonymization of user data instead of connecting users directly by name to their activity. Sometimes it can come through, you know, decoding things at a specific point or decrypting things at a specific point and then taking a look at them and then re-encrypting them. But you have to do that in a secure way, of course. You were the, the thing that gets me about DOH and like DNS over DNS over HTTP is that all it's going to drive us to do from a security perspective is decrypt everything at some point, and then all of a sudden you're all in plain text. And uh, yes, you're doing that at a very specific point with a specific tool that's supposed to be secure. But everybody here who works in security knows that uh, some of the least well secured devices on our network are typically our security platforms. So I don't love it. I mean, I almost, I'm almost i almost opposed to DNS over HTTP. I, I, I really am from a, at a corporate perspective, not a personal perspective, but inside an organization because it will drive the security people to have to do insecure things to do security. I, I don't love it. Now, the privacy in a personal standpoint at your house is very different from privacy in a corporate environment where you're trying to do enterprise-grade security. So uh, there's a lot of balancing there. We have to do a lot of risk modeling and we have to make decisions about how much privacy we can really offer our users in their day-to-day work and how much of an expectation of privacy they should have coming in and reading the terms of service when they log into their computer. So I've got a question just kind of following up. Uh, As a forensics analyst, what, whenever you're dealing with browser artifacts, what are some of your go-to tools and techniques 
for trying to look deeper into this blind spot. So for are you asking about network activity specifically? Or yeah, if you're using proxies or if you're using directly in the browser about yeah. cache. So you know, if you're if you're talking three. about actual encryption, sometimes you really have to rely on the endpoints. So um, EDR is really the I wish I could have EDR in every endpoint that I have to work with. Yeah. Uh, it's just beautiful, beautiful advancement in, in technology from multiple vendors. And I'm not talking about something that's just hacked on my antivirus either, but I'm talking about real so solid comprehensive EDR tools that have forensics capabilities and stuff and that can pull memory samples of different processes and stuff. And that's, that's fabulous, you know, and I obviously don't get a lot of that in the industrial environments that I work in, but yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're encrypting everything across the wire and you're not decrypting at some point in the network, then you've got to rely on the endpoints and you usually only see one endpoint. So that means you have to have really, really good endpoint monitoring. And then you're sending, again, a bunch of very personal, very private data about what's happening across the host to your security appliance. So again, we have to understand that by adding more privacy in, we're often reducing the security of users because we have to do these jury-rigged duct tape solutions to actually do security and detect the adversaries and uh, you know detect malware, et cetera. So it's, it's kind of crazy. but. Yeah, I mean, like that. Those types of endpoint tools are really what you've got to rely on there. If you're not at your gateway doing some kind of full, you know, decryption of of your your traffic that's going outbound. So yeah, go ahead, Paul. Let me uh, pile on. The mantra of the designers of these new technologies, these new transports, whether it's WebSockets, HTTPS, Quick. Uh, Etc. Uh, the mantra is that security isn't optional, or at least encryption isn't optional. So I'm starting to sort of really be annoyed by having to pay the SSH encryption and decryption costs when moving a multi gigabyte file from one virtual machine to the other through a hypervisor. I, I fully trust that environment. I don't want to use any CPU cycles to encrypt something that's only going to other transistors on the same board, but that choice is being taken out of my hands. So, Leslie, when you say things are crazy, I really want to pile on and say they are really, really perversely aligned and getting worse, trending worse. Well, and it, 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 let's talk about that, that trending worse, since this is such an uplifting <laughs> and life-affirming podcast on computer security. I, I, I do wonder this quite a bit. Are things actually getting worse? And, and I'm inclined to say they are, and they're not at the same time. Let, let, me, let me explain. If you're looking at Active Directory, you're looking at the endpoint. It seems like a lot of organizations are really getting good at doing something that they should have done 15 years ago. And they're still focusing on that. But now with cloud computing and everything else, like honestly, at BHIS, if we can gain access to an environment Getting on the endpoint is neat, but if you're a cloud environment, getting credentials and moving to Office 365 and gaining access to Google Cloud Compute resources, API keys that are out on GitHub, that's actually really powerful for us too. And I'm bringing this up because whenever we're talking about security of Chrome, whenever we're talking about security of Firefox, we're talking about security of operating systems, it still feels like a tremendous amount of the industry is still focusing on like buffer overflows or heap overflows, integer overflows, and use after free type vulnerabilities. And if you talk to a vendor and you basically say, hey, there's a misconfiguration here in this Amazon service that when it scales, all the instances that scale up are completely insecure, it takes them forever to get their heads around that. So is it just me or does it feel like in some ways like, oh, we got, we got that, we get exploits. Yeah, we're going to fix that. But all of this new stuff that's progressing so quickly is actually making it a lot easier for attackers to successfully break into organizations. Or am I missing something? I, I would say that mostly, I think security has got better, but I think that humans are always the weakest link. And it's like implementation problems. Like basically, yeah, you can do all this cool stuff with local storage. You can do all this stuff with, with, with a, whatever you name there's a lot of cool features that have came out. But then when you implement them and you implement them in a secure way, how many times have we seen S3 buckets wide open with data on them? Like, it's a cool, it's a cool thing, right? You know what I'm saying? And now that, you know, we just got, it's just so much stuff now that 
if you implement it in a bad way, it, it's terrible. If you 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 people throwing these lambdas all over the place now too, so you're doing this serverless stuff, and then they're like leaving just leaving stuff open is leaving that stuff open as well too. So it's just implementation, and and the fact that we're just putting everything in the cloud, it sucks, yeah. man. I mean, in modern adversaries, they, I, I teach a class, and my first rule that I teach my students is hackers are lazy, and it really makes everybody mad because all the red teamers are like, I'm not lazy, I work really hard, and yes, you do. <laughs> but if you take the path of least resistance, yes, you take the path of least resistance, because why would you, I mean, you work smarter, not harder. Why would you work harder, not smarter? That doesn't make any sense. Adversaries are exactly the same way, and if you leave your S3 bucket open, that's a lot easier than writing like a custom exploit and like doing some crazy exploitation and you know scanning and stuff. Like the stuff the stuff that we do in like the OSCP is devolved so far or divided so far from what actual adversaries are doing from an advanced perspective right now. They are just trying to get somebody's account and use the authorized tools and all the things that you've left wide open on your network to do their bad stuff. So because they don't have to try any harder, right? Why? Why would they want to though? Like, why should they try harder? Why? <laughs> why? Like, do, do the easiest thing. Okay. Hey, John, you mentioned buffer overruns, and this reminds me that a couple of years ago I gave a talk about GetS, talking about the Morris worm from the late '80s that used the GetS um, method of buffer overrun. First time I'd seen it, and that GetS is still part of the standard C library in most distributions. And so what I want to say about the trend about uh, security, you know, whether the new stuff we're blind to, is uh, the Internet has changed a lot of stuff. It's, you know, rewritten human history. It's, re it's an inflection point for good or evil, depending on your point of view. But what's happened is that you used to have to be my age to qualify as a general who had spent your whole career training to fight the previous war. Now there are people decades younger than me that are in the same damn situation. Well, it, and it, it, we're touching on something, and I, don't, I have not talked to you, the people on the panel at all um, about this, but I'm going to bring it up. So one of the debates that's happening in this industry is a debate that I remember happening you know, 20 years ago, and then again about 2008, and then another, I think it was like 2013, and this time it's kicking up again. And I need to make it very clear. You know, when we're talking about disclosure, like there's vulnerability disclosure, and then there's tools that red teams create that they release to the public. It's this pendulum that goes back and forth every single, like, say it's a cycle of about five or six years, where the community is like, yay, offensive tools, they're great. And then it comes back the other way. And it's like, if you're releasing offensive tools to the community or exploits to the community, you're just making the bad people's lives easier. And it goes back and forth. It absolutely does. And I mean, I'm a red teamer. I know where I come on, where I land on this. But I'd like to get your opinion because honestly, like when you have people like Richard Bachelick and Florian talking about, hey, you're releasing offensive tools that we're seeing in actual attacks, that is a valid argument about those tools being released publicly. But once again, I think that those things are important. And that's my opinion. And a lot of these people that are on this webcast have heard my opinion. I would like to get your all's opinion about offensive tooling and sharing tools and techniques in the community. And Paul, I'm going to start with you again, once again, the Brady Bunch theme and the fact that, you know, you're, you talked about being the grizzled old general fighting yesterday's wars that look a lot like today's wars. So go ahead. So I've always liked the idea of responsible disclosure. I like the idea that you're going to give the supply chain a chance to heal itself before you expose the vulnerability. But I've also always liked the sort of absolute maximum time limit so that a vendor who would prefer not to pay those costs and would just rather this be swept under the rug does not have that choice available because we know from what Leslie reminded us a few moments ago, no one will work harder than they have to. If the path of least resistance is that something is never revealed, then to a lot of vendors, that looks like the best, best outcome. It's not. Not for them, not for us, not for the economy. And that has to be off the table. But I've heard Richard's arguments about this, and I think he's spot on, which is if, if what you're going to do is uh, pronounce a zero day because that will make you look good on a conference, a security conference stage somewhere, 
uh, you're doing a lot more harm than good. And you may be helping your career, but you are not helping your own cause in any other way. So I, you know, I, I think we should double down the way that bug bounties work and the way that uh, responsible disclosure has been sort of defined by all of the different digital industries, the software, the networks, everybody has some version of this. And I love it. I think it's, I think it's a good plan. But not everybody agrees with that, and not everybody even understands why we have this model or that we have this model. So I think better publicity is necessary, but I think the model is fine. Uh, Marcus? I think that... that, uh, like that a, you're like, oh, God, what did you just drag me into? But go ahead. <laughs> Well, no, no, you know me. I, I, I speak my mind, so I'm good. We got people that speak exactly what's on their mind here, so we're all good. <laughs> the problem, I think that I I have a thinking. I think because I'm I'm brainwashed. I was I'm ex-military. I'm always want to be on the side of the good, no matter what I do. If it's if it comes to exploitation, I got a zero day <laughs> from probably 10 years ago that haven't been fixed, right? But I told I told the people, hey, this is a problem. So it's like a Hippocratic oath that I think all security professionals should take. And we should be on, we should always be fighting for good. And and I, I believe in, there should be some kind of responsible, uh, responsible disclosure. We shouldn't be just w trying to wait, trying to watch the world burn. I think that, Man, it, it kind of sucks because I think some maybe maybe the conferences should should step up the game too and not allow not allow these things to take take place. You got to give the people a, a a little bit of time to to fix it. In my case, I found a zero day. I could exploit anybody on something. I, we talked to the company and the lawyers, and they were like, the, the security team is like, yeah, we want to fix it. The product runs the company. And so it never got fixed as far as I know. So it might still be out there. But, I mean, I felt bad. And the company I was working for said, oh, we can't tell anybody because we're trying to sell our product to them. <laughs> so, yeah, Hippocratic Oath, you know, try to do more good than bad and um, give people time to fix stuff. If they don't fix it, you know, if you legally can do it, don't put yourself in jeopardy. That's all I got. So be careful. All right, Leslie. You know, so I'm pretty much agreed. Um, some people really hate the term responsible disclosure. It's become kind of like a, a big debate point in the professional community. And look, I think a lot of people hate it because they, they're being told they're being irresponsible when the companies that they are disclosing things to aren't being responsive. And we've all been there. We've all reported a compromise site or a vulnerability to, a, to an organization, and they have either fought us or they've threatened to sue us. You know, it's, it's been a horrible experience. And at that point, what do you want to do? Well, you want to, you want to, if they're a hospital or something, you want to go out there and you want to go, this hospital's really insecure. Do something, do something, do something just to get something done because you've been fighting with them for so long. And I understand that frustration, but that doesn't, that isn't a solid argument against needing a process, a, 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 an a, ethic ethics surrounding responsible disclosure. You still want to make sure that you are providing organizations adequate time and information and access to the information they need to respond to a vulnerability or a compromised disclosure. That takes time, especially for some of these large, large organizations that are mired in bureaucracy. And so there has to be, yes, there has to be firm time limits on this. You have to make a, a point of, at this point, I will disclose to XYZ. Absolutely. And these organizations should have bug bounty programs. They should be accepting of these these requests. And yes, it's very frustrating, but that doesn't mean that you just you know put put your 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 discovery out there for kicks to get a cool talk at DEF CON. Like I, that, that doesn't do anybody any good, except for maybe you. Except you look kind of bad to all of us who are like, why didn't you give them a chance? Like why didn't you give this organization it's a, a, a time period to try to fix this before you went public? Like. There's a balance there. There's a fine line. And in the end, as they both said, we are trying to make things secure, not less secure. Like we're, we're trying to we're trying to improve security. And sometimes you feel like 
the only thing you can do is, is take the car out at 70 miles an hour and hack the brakes. Like, okay, that gets things done. Yes. But did you spend some time before that doing X, Y, Z to get the things done? And in the case that I mentioned, they absolutely did try to, to try to disclose things responsibly first, but is that is that the right thing to do all the time? No, probably not. But I, I understand the frustration. I get it. I get it. It's really frustrating when you're trying to fix some important critical thing and the company's not doing anything. So yeah, I'm you know what's that's... funny about this is oh, that people. I know that people come to y'all all the time, like me, because we have like a little public persona, and they'll have a zero day. <laughs> Hey, Marcus, what should I do with the zero day? <laughs> yes, bro. <laughs> yeah. And and there's a lot of them. And I, I don't think that people quite understand that. I mean, if you're talking about exploitation of an operating system, that is getting very, very, very hard, right? And, and, I, and I love it when I'm at a conference and uh, it's always someone that's fairly young in the industry. And they're like, yeah, exploiting Windows systems and writing exploits for Windows is easy. And it's like, you're new here and you don't know what you're talking about. That's, it's actually incredibly difficult to do, but there's still like these perceptions, right? And I, I think that we need the offensive security people without question. I think as far as exploitation and disclosure, I think that that has gotten a lot better with the major vendors. Like if you're talking to Microsoft or Google to a lesser extent, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to work with them because it's a well-worn path. But when you're getting off that path, to vendors that are not the mainline vendors that you see, it's still a nightmare, right? There's still th threats of lawsuits. They don't bother to fix things. Marcus, in your situation, I, I think, you know, one of the concerns that you would give to somebody if you have a vulnerability and you tried to disclose it and they did nothing about that vulnerability, it actually puts you at risk if somebody else finds that same vulnerability and releases it because they can come back to you. So I don't believe that there's a clean answer to this, but two things I, I, I want to kind of leave for this particular topic is, one, I fundamentally believe that things are only fragile till they break. And as part of breaking things, we build our architectures better. And I think that anybody that breaks should also be a builder. Uh, always share how you can make things better. And the other thing that I think is interesting is Josh Wright's law of exploits. If you find an exploit for something and you go to a vendor and you say, here's a, here's a Python script, to exploit this, here's what this looks like in, in, in like burp and packet captures. It's probably not going to get fixed. But if you roll out an exploit in Metasploit, that will get fixed almost within in the next 48 hours. So I think it has a lot to do with how we disclose things and release them. So the, the kind of the final question, this has been a very, like I said, uplifting. It's like, we're all screwed. Everything's growing. There's new technologies dropping out of the sky. They're completely insecure. We're hosed. Hooray. Um, I want to turn around. What what do you look at as positive trends that give you hope for the future in information security, if anything? So once again, Paul. Hopeful trends. So a lot of uh, where we are is due to structural defects uh, in sort of the, the tooling that we started with. Uh, we're still building processors, for example, that are good for the C programming language. And the C programming language was originally crafted on a PDP-11 that had linear memory addressing, which means that all processors have to simulate that, even though memory is not actually linear, and there's uh, you know, a fair amount of uh, VM and other uh, sort of witchcraft going on to make it appear so. And this is a problem, and one of the big problems that we have is that the more we enable these old technologies, we're not just holding ourselves back in terms of what the performance could be if we didn't simulate the old uh, the, the old architectures. It's that we're we're bringing our bugs with us as we go forward, and so we've got. Of course, Moore's law has been kind in the years since the C programming language was created. We've doubled the number of transistors and the number of gigahertz and so forth any number of times, but we have misspent the bounty that uh, Moore's law has given us by continuing to use uh, languages with pointer arithmetic. Why would you do that? Well, because that's what the project is already written in. That's what the team knows how to do, whatever, you know, bad reason. And uh, we're, we've sort of said, let's just do the same thing, but have it be faster, but not as fast as it could be, but at least it will be faster, better benchmarks, and so on. And so what gives me some hope is a new generation of languages that we're starting to see, uh, chief among them Golang and Rust, 
which take the attitude of, you know, pointer arithmetic isn't necessary. It was a good hack, but let's just not have that. Uh, let's have pointers be a little more opaque. Let's uh, let's put some rules around this. Let's spend a few more of the CPU cycles that uh, Moore's law has given us on safety issues like array bounds checking or reference checking or garbage collection or use after free or you know that type of thing. So we're finally, in my opinion, on the right track in terms of taking the increase in resources, which is our foundation for the systems we build, and using some of that as kind of a safety tax. We've never paid a safety tax until the last couple of years. And so that, that's what gives me some hope, is that we might someday start, uh, birth an entire generation of developers who doesn't like pointer arithmetic, and when they hear about it, they feel about it the way they also feel about, let's say, 6502 assembly language. That's cool, I'm glad I studied it, but I don't ever wanna do it. And so we may be on the cusp of a generation that just does things the right way and doesn't complain about it. All right, Marcus. You know what's funny, man? This is not related to technology. I, well, I think it may be a little bit related to technology. I think that we just have a nicer bunch of hackers in the community. <laughs> when I came in, when I came in the game, people weren't so nice and and all that stuff. Now we have a community of people that uplift, teach, help out people, give free training, free conferences. And I think the technology has helped because of social media. And like right now, we're, we, you know, we're doing this. So tech has helped. But I think in general, we have a bunch of nice people in the game now. U.S. and jerks, too. But but the nice people inspire me. Just how how people help each other out, and that's what gives me hope for cybersecurity. Because I think that most of the things, again, uh, and Paul, I'm, I love GoLang, by the way. But it's just the tech has gotten better. But most of the things we do is an implementation problem, and that's where we get hurt so much. Is where you know we we give you a dang sword, you can chop your foot off. Or you can you can help defend the network. So what are you gonna do? But yeah, I love I love the people and and uh, and I'm I'm glad to have so many awesome people in the community you now. Leslie. Yes, yeah, so I'm gonna do a people and technology shout out here, and it's one I never thought like 10 years ago I would give, but it's to Microsoft. And I am so impressed at how they've improved their security posture and their security teams and the security in their operating systems. Since, you know, the last decade, the last two decades, um, there was a point in time where Microsoft was just the be all end all target for everything. And I got to admit, Windows 10, when you configure it properly, is a pretty secure operating system. Like they did a really good job securing it, building in native security, building in decent security controls. And they've also built a really good security response team that's doing a lot of important work. And man, if Microsoft can turn that around 180 degrees, anything's possible. They, they, they have changed their security posture so drastically. And they're, they're one of the leaders in the security game now. So if they can do it, any, any of these companies could do it. They, they, the, the possibility is there to completely change your security posture and build more secure things. Very cool. I'm going to kind of, kind of jump off of what Marcus was talking about. I, I, I say this at a lot of presentations. I don't think people understand just how bad this community was like like 15 to 20 years ago, right? They talk, everyone talk, talks about gatekeeping and how we need to take gates down. We have taken down a tremendous number of gates in this industry. You know, it's, you see it pop up a little bit with people like, well, how many CVEs do you have? And trying to set up that type of flexing every once in a while. It was so much worse so, so much worse years and years ago around the turn of the century. It's, it's to the point where there's a lot of people in this industry that, you know, they won't even acknowledge their past. Like if you go and call them by their old hacker name, they will not respond to you because it was just that toxic. So I think that the toxicity is a lot less. We have a long way to go, but it's a lot better than it was. And also part of that group, I, I think I'm in the minority on this. I, I talk to a lot of business owners, and there's a lot of complaints about millennials. And, and don't get me wrong, millennials can be an absolute pain in the ass. There's no question. But here's the deal. A lot of those millennials, a lot of this younger generation that's coming up, 
I have never seen a group of people that can dive into the technology and try to learn it as deep and as quick as they do. They seem to be very dedicated. They seem to be exceptionally bright in what they're doing. And they're very, very motivated to try to do the right thing. And I think if that's properly leveraged in organizations, that younger generation is just amazing. I know as an old person, I'm supposed to be like, all oh, these young kids get off my, yacht, my, my, my lawn and chase them off with a pitchfork. But I've been nothing but impressed with it. And I will say, I see, like Marcus also mentioned, the amount of free training that's out there, it really makes me happy. Seeing the amount of people that are dedicating and donating their time to the community to build the community rather than trying to take that community down is just phenomenal. And, and I, I have people approach me and they'll say, I'll say, hey, I want to do a training class. This was on Twitter a while ago. I want to do a training class, but I suck. I, I don't think I'm going to be very good. And I believe that in this day and age, that's the wrong way to look at it. I think you can present in a way that may not be as good, subjectively speaking, for a lot of people as somebody else, but you're going to resonate with somebody. And you should be out there and you should be presenting and you should be doing training, even if it's just a handful of people that resonate with your style and the way that you're doing it. Damn, that's great. I spent the majority of my professional career chasing, trying to make everybody happy across the spectrum. And that's just not feasible. So the more voices, the more perspectives that we have, the better off that we're going to be. And I, and I think that we need to continue to drive that forward. And once again, I, you know, just it seems like a lot of the trajectory I'm seeing in the offensive community is the amount of people that want to inform defense and do better on that is also encouraging. So, all right, so we've got 10 minutes, or it's eight minutes or so. I wanted to open it up to the Discord channel and see if there's any questions for the people that are on our panel. So, you know, this is the part where you can type stuff in. And then we'll, we'll, add, we'll answer any of the questions that you have. So it's like, ask me anything about it. So we got one that was sent directly to me. I, I don't think they wanted to call it out directly to, to Leslie. The question was, really? Microsoft's doing good on security? Yes, I, I would definitely say Microsoft is doing very well on security. Leslie, do you want to talk about a couple of things as well? And we can talk about ATP. We can talk about what they're doing for uh, uh, protection, file protection for ransomware. There's a bunch of things, but go ahead. That was your thing. No, so no, absolutely. I totally agree with ATP. Like, I know it's painful. I'm a Linux person. Like, this is this is wild. Like, I, I don't even know what to say, but they've done. I mean, and I, that doesn't mean that I think everything Microsoft is doing is awesome. I hate their licensing. Like, I think it's terrible. But I don't like their telemetry. But like, in terms of like building an ATP encryption full disk encryption you know making it easy and accessible for users encouraging the use of, of security products encouraging the use of password managers even edge is not it's not internet explorer guys it's not internet explorer like i i don't necessarily use it every day but they've done good work there and i think that we need to recognize that because like there is this perception in the security community that microsoft is a load of hooey but <laughs> yeah like uh, you have to recognize these companies that make a big turnaround on security because that, that's an incentive for other companies to do that too, especially the ones that are really problematic right now. Cool. Another open question from Extreme Paperclip. What would you recommend folks spend their time, energy, and learning? I'm throwing this wide, I'm just going to start out by saying, if, if you're in security and you don't know a coding language, learn one. Python is a great start. We had mentioned Golang. That would be my contribution. What do, what do you all think people should be focusing on learning in the industry? I think a lot of folks um, treat as opaque everything below them on the networking stack. So they don't necessarily understand that their reliable byte stream is getting turned into packets. And those packets might have to be retransmitted and they have checksums and that sometimes the packet is too big. There's, there's a whole bunch of stuff happening below the average Golang or Python programmer on the stack that is worthy of time. It's uh, it's worth, you don't have to become an expert. You don't have to decide you're going to do that instead of what, what you really came here to do. But understanding your place in the communications stack is, I think, as valuable as learning to code. 
I tell people that you want to be solid. I think there's like three domains. I think you want to be, I, I mean, so I just say, look, be, understand how the operating systems work, Linux and Windows, know how to code a little bit, just so you script something so that it saves you time, right? And, uh, and know how the, the network works and how does traffic work. And, and, and so if you have a solid understanding of that, you know, so I say, be, be, be competent system, system administration, be competent in network administration, and, and, uh, and know how to code and script stuff. If you can do those three, you're going to be real solid and, and, and try to have a, like a little bit of that. And as you grow and as you get older, you'll realize that stuff doesn't change that much. You know, you know, if you learn Python now, you can go pivot and learn going. If you know how Linux worked back in the day, if you know how Unix worked back in the day, you could hop into Linux and then you could hop into Mac. You know, and, and there is not. So learn the basics really well of all those three and you, you'll eat for life. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would also tell people, don't jump into exploitation, please, for the love of all that's holy. Don't, don't do that. I, and people are like, well, I really want to get into writing exploits. How do I do that? And honestly, the best way that you get into writing exploits is just like Marcus said, you focus on those fundamentals and then something's going to be interesting to you. You're going to dig deep into that thing. You're going to get good at that thing. And you know, the, you'll find the weaknesses. Let it come naturally. Don't jump into classes and try to, you know, we're going to talk about buffer overflows and use after free and doing all of that right out of the gate because one, there's not that much of a need for it in the industry. It just isn't. And then the other reason is it's, it's, it, those, those Easter eggs are becoming rarer and rarer, but that doesn't mean there's not vulnerabilities out there. There's a lot of them, but they're usually in other ways as well. Is it, is it beneficial to learn assembly? What do you all think? I, I kind of would say no, but what do you take? Depends on what niche you want to get into in security. If you want to do yeah. like malware reversing, then you need to know assembly. Some forensics work, some exploit development, you need to know assembly. Other things, you don't need to know assembly. Yeah. All right. We've got another one, mild sauce. Oh, specific add, oh go before ahead. Before you get into, I'll, I'll just add it. Just understand how how flow control and basic logic works in programming. Then you learn assembly. <laughs> so learn a higher yeah. level first, and then go down. I would say, but Paul might have a different opinion. I I want to. It's sort of me repeating myself. I don't think everybody needs to be able to do it for a living, but I think everybody needs to be able to look at the heart bleed heart bleed exploit and understand how it works and and know what a microarchitecture is. So it's worth everybody in the security industry's time to at least go read one book on the topic so that you'll know that stuff is happening so that when other people are talking about it, the, uh, the connections will be made in your head. Of course, if it, if it takes you by storm and becomes the thing you obsess over, then, hey, that's good, too, but it probably won't. Yeah. Oh, a quick one. We're probably going to go over, but I, I do want to throw this out there. How do you see the changing scenario with COVID affecting information security? We didn't even touch on that. That's pretty huge. Anyone want to jump in on that one? Well, what I'm seeing is a lot of people under economic duress, because they've lost their jobs or the supply chain that they were part of is uh, frozen. And they are turning to crime because they got bills to pay. So we're seeing a lot more people doing a lot more low-end sort of uh, newbie bullshit. And, you know, that'll show up in the DNS with uh, an almost endless parade of COVID-19 fake sites about dis disinformation or donations or, you know, whatever it is. So, you know, we're seeing just a huge uptick of people interested in leveraging this, and some of them are in uh, you know, the dire straits for the first time in their uh, modern career because of COVID itself. Anyone else? I think, I think COVID. I think COVID is going to change how enterprises work. I think most, a lot of people aren't going to go back to the corporate environment, so they're going to have to figure out how to do security remotely. Yep. And and having to rely on, I don't know who said it before. Maybe maybe it was you, John. Like, or I think it was Leslie, actually, you're, you're doing, you got this corporate network, you got your firewall, you got all this other stuff, but now 
you're taking that computer out of the enterprise. Now what? And now you mm-hmm. have all the other stuff we complained about. Plus, they're they're Lone Ranger. They're they're Lone Ranger, and somewhere and don't they don't have any infrastructure. So that's gonna suck. Yep. Absolutely. Split tunnel VPNs are going to be the end of us all. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. It, everyone's like zero trust computing. It's here. Surprise! Oh, and you're not ready. So, no. all right, everybody, that draws us to a close. I want to say thank you very much for attending. We really, really appreciate it. Be sure to check out Wild West Hack and Fest. The, so our, our speakers today will get like unfettered hour to do and talk about whatever they want to. Which God have mercy on all of us. And uh, so please keep coming to this stuff, and we hope to see you at another webcast sometime soon.